Hello there everyone, this is the Wayback Tech and it's about two days before Christmas and I got another Socket 7 CPU to do a video on. I don't know if it really deserves its own video but I will we'll do one on it. In the Socket 7 face-off video, in the description I made mention that I, I wasn't interested in the wind chip and that's why I didn't test it because I never bought one. I'd only buy one if the price was right on it and uh, I, I found one for the price that I wanted to pay, at least the price that the seller agreed to so I got that chip and I started doing some benchmarks on it here and got that all captured so yeah we'll, we'll take a look at it here and uh, uh, don't get your hopes up too high on this processor because it really does suck it sucked back then when it was new and it still sucks today but well I'll, I'll give it its own video why not and it might be interesting to some people I don't know but well anyway let's go ahead and take a look at this damn thing all right well here it is the IDT wind chip C6 this was uh, made by a division of IDT called Centaur and I don't really have any idea why they called it that but yeah this chip is actually not really all that remarkable IDT sold these chips as kind of a very low-end entry-level budget oriented computer system kind of a processor that these things went into there were two wars that were being fought back in the 90s the late 90s anyway one was 3d gaming and the other was low-cost processors and I guess IDT felt that this was a market that they wanted to enter into it's stable it seems to work pretty good this is probably one of the highest rated voltages for a socket 7 processor that I've ever seen Given the fact that this is an MMX chip and it's uh, towards the latter end of the Socket 7 era, a 3.52 volt core, that's uh, quite a bit of voltage for a Socket 7 CPU by this time, when most chips, even the Cyrix chips, were running 2.8, 2.9 volts. The AMD K6 chip, the 233, was rated for 3.2 volts, but... I think all AMD did on that chip was overclock a K6200 and bu bump up the voltage a little bit on that chip, honestly. So 3.52, you didn't really see that except in the earlier Pentium processors. I'm actually running this chip at 2.9 volts and it seems to be handling that just fine. I haven't had any weird crashes or anything like that. I don't know if the seller was entirely honest because even though the seller did list this chip as, you know, as for gold recovery and the picture clearly showed some of the bent pins, uh, it was not, I couldn't tell in the picture, and he didn't list it, that three of the pins were completely sheared off of this processor. So I had to replace the pins with some wire that I twisted together there and soldered on and trimmed them down. So it, it works. I, I don't know about that. It doesn't seem very honest to me, but, you know, I guess you could go either way on that one. So to keep this an even comparison with the previous Socket 7 face-off, I'm um, using the same motherboard, same video card, everything's the same here. 100 megahertz bus with a 2x multiplier for a 200 megahertz clock speed and I'm going to be comparing this with the Cyrix processor because well let's face it it's not going to compete with an AMD K6 and it certainly is not going to compete with a Pentium so yeah we'll just look at the next low end one up from the IDT wind chip and we'll compare it to that one as far as the footage from the Cyrix processor, this is all the same footage that I used in the Socket 7 face-off because there's really no reason to rerun those benchmarks. Just need to run benchmarks for the IDT wind chip. So uh, here we go, folks. Let's take a look at Superscape here. Yeah, it's not even competitive with the Cyrix chip, although the Cyrix chip does do impressively well on this benchmark for whatever reason. So. Well, we'll, uh, we'll move on from that one. Actually, this chip is closer to the Intel Pentium chip as far as Superscape is concerned, but in PC player benchmark, we can see that this chip's only scoring a 41.8, making it definitely by far the slowest chip that I've tested in the Socket 7 platform on this benchmark. Slower than even the Pentium 200 MMX chip, which only scored 59.9 or 8 or something like that. So it's not looking good for this IDT wind chip at all on this benchmark. Things get a little bit worse for the IDT chip when we're looking at Doom here. Doom is playing good, but as you're going to see in a minute here, the score is absolutely horrendous for a Socket 7 processor at 200 megahertz. 
1201 real ticks that is about 400 slower 400 real ticks slower than the Pentium 200 was and I think that was around 800 something or another so and the Cyrix processor and the other ones they were around 700 to 800 so patting its way through Quake here it doesn't look too bad but the actual final score is going to be horrendous actually you can see the Cyrix processor is easily overtaking this chip by a large margin there 27.5 frames per second is all this processor can manage in Quake surprisingly as you'll see in a minute, we're going to be taking a look at the microscope benchmarks and you'll see that the floating point unit is actually not that bad compared to the Cyrix and the AMD chips. Remember, on the Cyrix and AMD chips, the floating point unit was virtually identical in speed with only about a thousand or so, maybe not even that, separating the two. So I'm not entirely certain what the Pentium instruction set's like on this processor, so I think it's probably, if it has any at all, it's probably not very good. Although applications do seem to recognize this chip as a Pentium, so at least it has some kind of a Pentium instruction set to it. You can see that the instructions per second here on the CPU and the numeric processing unit, uh, 101,000 instructions per second. That's not terribly bad, but that's actually pretty low for a Socket 7 chip compared to the AMD and the Cyrix and the Intel offerings at 200 megahertz. Uh, 67,000 roughly is what the floating point unit is doing that's not actually too bad but you can take a look at the megahertz right there and I guarantee this chip is running at 200 megahertz but it's a very interesting phenomenon that happens with microscope I don't know exactly how microscope is determining the megahertz because as you'll see here in the system configuration when I look at the system information it does see it as a 200 megahertz chip but it's interesting that it's recognizing it as only being equivalent to I guess 111 megahertz Pentium processor. So when I said this chip feels more like a 133 to a 150, um, maybe I'm being a little too generous because Microscope actually thinks it's closer to a 120. With Descent here, we can see a good example of real-world gameplay on this processor. Uh, it's it's not bad. It's definitely nicely playable. It's it's smooth. It's not as fluid though. The frame rate's not as fluid, in my opinion, as it was on the Cyrix processor and the AMD K6 and even the Pentium 200. Um, it's There's moments when it stutters and kind of slows down a little bit. You can tell the frame rate drops when more activity starts going on with more robots trying to get you and the room's getting bigger and things like that. When there's more chaos on the screen, it, it does tend to seem to hit. Um, there seems to be a hit in performance there. It actually feels to me like a Pentium 133, honestly, when playing Descent. Maybe a 150 if I'm feeling generous. But yeah, you could you could do it. It wouldn't hurt anything. You'd 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 win a few battles with it. Comparing this processor side by side with the level two cache enabled versus disabled, you can see that there's only just a little bit over a one frame per second difference there in Quake. And this implies that the process is really not taking all that much advantage of the level 2 cache. And maybe this processor was really intended to be optimal for motherboards that didn't come with level 2 cache. And that could be because a lot of motherboards that didn't come with level 2 cache were tend to be a little bit cheaper. But by socket, late socket 7 era though, um, that was pretty uncommon. I'm pretty sure all motherboards by that time period came with 512k of level 2 cache at least. There might have been some with 256 still, but level 2 cache was pretty much standard on motherboards by this point in time, so I'm not really sure what to make of that, but it, it is what it is, and there's really, it, all, this is true with all the benchmarks as well, it's, it's uh, yeah, there doesn't seem to really be taking much advantage of this level 2 cache, and I really don't know why actually, but yeah, that, that was an interesting thing I thought anyway. Well, to summarize, this processor sucks about as much as I thought it was going to suck. The Win chip might actually be better under Windows 95 or Windows 98 environment. The floating point unit doesn't score that much worse. It actually scores identical pretty much, give or take a few hundred points, to the AMD and the Cyrix offerings. So that implies that it might not do too bad under a Windows environment with MMX enhanced gaming and um, a little bit of luck. 
it might not do too bad. The integer performance, I think, is hurting it in the DOS area, though. It feels more like a 486, honestly, than it does a Pentium. When I say that, I mean the 586-133 chip, that runs more like a Pentium 66 to a Pentium 75. That's about where that thing is at. You get that sucker cranking at 200 megahertz or nearly 200 megahertz, it feels more like a Pentium 90, 100, maybe 120 if you're really, really lucky. And this chip feels a lot about the same. It feels like you are got 200 megahertz, but it's really only performing at about a 120 or 133 level. So, uh, I don't know. I'm going to take a look at this processor again probably at some point under a Windows environment and uh, maybe give it another chance to see if it can claw its way up the ladder a little bit further. But I, I don't have a whole lot of hopes for it. I, I, I don't think it's, it might get up, get up right closer to the Cyrix processor. It might get right up under it there, but I don't think it's going to beat the Cyrix processor. <clears throat> and you can't really expect a whole lot because this chip wasn't sold as a performance processor. It was a, you know, the cheapest thing you could buy. So, I don't think it was worth it. I think you would have been better off buying a used Pentium 150 or 166 processor, frankly, instead of this thing. But, you know. So, that's why they fold. That's why they didn't make any money either. They processors sucked and nobody bought them. <clears throat> and then Via bought them. And then their processors sucked because they didn't want to go with Cyrus. That's what happened with that. So, anyway. I'm the Wayback Tech and I'm going to get my butt out of here. And uh, good to bed, actually, because it's getting late. So take care, everyone. Peace out. And uh, we'll see you again right here next time on the Wayback Tech channel.